Good evening. <laughs> I have had a good day. You? Awesome. I notice I have a different music stand, which is very nice. I'll tell you one of the stories about me versus the music stand. I was asked to do a four-week series at a church on the Psalms. Not that you needed to know what, what I was doing. Anyways, I was, I was my very first time with them. And I went to do this, and the whole top came off and off the stage. <laughs> so luckily, I always put it in a notebook. So that was good. But we laugh about it now. <laughs> So I am Kelly Dagley. Um, I am a professor at Hope International University. For those of you who were not here last night, welcome. Um, my specialty is Old Testament, and I have been charged with the task, no, the joy, of teaching you the Old Testament this week. And uh, last night I gave a warning, because tonight we are um, going to talk about a text that um, it contains some abuse, some sexual abuse. And so I give that warning again. Um, if you have been sexually abused and you don't think you can make it through this, if, or if partway through you feel, you feel like you can't handle it, go ahead and leave. I am okay with that. You're more important. Take care of yourself. So that said... Um, this week, or this week, um, tonight we're going to be talking about the rape of Tamar in um, 2 Samuel chapter 13. I am a woman. Shocker. I'm a woman. Um, I cannot separate myself from my gender when I read. Whenever I read the biblical text, I read as a woman. This is my social vocation. Middle class, white, American woman reading the text. I bring a perspective to the text that half the world has. Um, and often that half doesn't get their say. Um, it isn't recognized. And so I'm going to share you, with you my perspective, my, me reading this text as a woman. Um, and as I've said, as a woman, I have been marginalized. I have been discounted from ministry jobs because I'm a woman. I have been paid less in ministry jobs because I'm a woman. Um, I have been harassed because I'm a woman. Um, I have been marginalized because I am a woman. In my work as a scholar, I try to find women that are sometimes hidden in the text. Uh, they may appear in the story, but when I read as a woman, I find that there's more to uncover. Um, I want to imagine women's experiences occurring in the story. Um, the, our Jewish friends have a midrash, and midrash is an exercise of interpretation. Often it's reading between the lines and imagining what could have happened within the confines of the word on the, on the page. And so I like to do women's midrash and imagine what it's like for the women on the page. I want to listen for women's voices that have been covered or suppressed by centuries of tradition. Um, there are books in the Old Testament that are probably women's literature, passed down by women um, through the centuries. And eventually, the men are like, that sounds like a pretty good story. Let's write it down. So they did. And we still have those stories. That's great. And so, but I like to look into it and try and find what, it, what, is, what is the patriarchal narrative and then what is the women's story. It's a lot of fun doing that. Um, I want to sometimes speak out for the abused and oppressed women in the text, and that's what I'm doing tonight. And I want to listen to other women who are doing this work, women who look like me and women who don't look like me. Um, I just I want to listen to all women. One of those people is Phyllis Tribble. Um, she's an Old Testament scholar who's written a, a couple of books on women's experience in the text. 
Uh, she is a groundbreaker. Uh, just a fan fabulous, fabulous scholar, and I think she's still alive. She's been around a while, but it's going to be a sad day when that Google message goes out. Uh, so in 1984, Phyllis Tribble um, published a book called Texts of Terror, which recounts tales of terror in memoriam to offer sympathetic readings of abused women. It interprets stories of outrage on behalf of their female victims in order to recover a neglected history, to remember a past that the present embodies, and to pray that these terrors shall not come to pass again. Um, she also says the, that sad stories do not have happy endings. And so we often skip over them. We don't read them. We don't preach on them. We, and then when we're doing our daily Bible reading, we get to them and we're like, what in the world is going on? Um, end of Judges, anyone? Mm, terrifying. Um, so additionally, these stories are often one of God's people being horribly treated and often at the hands of another of God's people. What do we do with that? That's one of those examples where it's an example not to follow. Don't do what they do. Yet, what if these texts of terror were to be seen as indispensable to the message of the Bible? This is the story of Tamar, Hagar, the Levite's concubine. And there's another one I can't remember, and I'm very sad, but there's four of them. Um, so what if they're not hidden away but given honor and special care when they are presented? And what about treating victims today in the same way, with special care? <clears throat> That's what I want to challenge us to do. Um, I also want to share with you a method, a literary mef method for approaching um, Old Testament narratives. One, another one of my favorite scholars is um, Robert Alter. He's a Jewish scholar. Je I mean, all literary studies go back to Robert Alter. He's amazing. You can buy his entire translation of the Hebrew Bible in three volumes, and it is one of my prized possessions. I will tell you that. Um, so he f um, discovered, or he theorizes, that there are four peculiarities of Hebrew narrative. So when you are reading any story from Genesis through the end of Kings and even Chronicles, you can use this summit with the New Testament as well. Look for these things. This is what they did. Words. Um, biblical Hebrew is very economical. Do you know how much parchment was back then? Do you know what parchment was? Sheep skin all stretched out. It's little time. It's thin, 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 thin leather. And it takes a long time to make it, and it was very expensive. So you're going to write any words you write on that. It's going to be thought out, and you're going to want to know that it's going to stay there. So it's very economical. Any word on the page is important if it's there. Um, often there are theme words. There are uh, words repeated um, to get to create meaning. Um, in the story of Jacob, stones. Stones are there often. And stones are a stumbling block to him. Stones show that he is facing obstacles. So if you read Jacob, look for the stones. You'll see them pop up everywhere. Um, then there are actions. And sometimes actions are repeated. How many times does Abraham pass off Sarah as his sister? Twice. And how many times does his son do the same thing? One. Just like daddy. Uh, not Sarah, Rebecca, or Rebecca, his own wife. <laughs> but um, but that, that's one of those type scenes that where the actions are kind of repeated. And so sometimes I'm going to be talking about type scene when I talk about Ruth uh, in a few days uh, and how a type scene can be like reused. Uh, for instance, if you have the story of Cinderella, what if you have the story of Cinderfella? It's going to be different. And so the differences are what really makes it interesting. So actions. And then dialogue. In Hebrew narrative, all the action takes place in the dialogue. If it's important, it's spoken. That speech act is really important. <clears throat> so if there's any speaking, pay attention to it. Um, and then there is the narrator. The narrator is unobtrusive. 
Um, he doesn't pass judgment and leaves it up to the reader. Um, so pay attention to descriptions as well. Uh, the setting, the physical descriptions, those are all important, and that'll be important to our story today. So words, actions, dialogue, and then the narrator. Those are really important. If you have those four and you jump into the Old Testament, you're going to find a lot of fun stuff, I tell you. Take my word on that. So now to one of these texts of terror, um, 2 Samuel 13. When reading a text that describes the abuse of women, here are some thoughts, I think, that can help us to be able to engage meaningfully in, with this text. Number one, recognize the sexual violence. This is being a sacred witness for these ancient women today. Yes, it happened. I believe this text that says this happened. Recognize the sexual violence. Don't gloss over it. Number two, read it for the experience of the abused woman. She is your central character. This requires some imagination. You need to fill in the gaps around the text with what the woman in those, circumstance, in those circumstances might think or feel. Um, if, you're gonna, if you are going to work through this text uh, to bring healing, to, to bring redemption, she has got to be your main character. She has got to be. Uh, number three, if there, recognize female resistance in the text. Does she speak uh, back? Does she try and push back? What's going on there? Um, that can be very helpful uh, for people who have experienced sexual violence when they're reading this and they see the woman resist and push back. Um, vicariously reliving through that can, can be helpful. Uh, where, are women, where are women able to use their voices or their agency? Um, if none, maybe imagine how you hope this woman in this text would resist, um, would push back. That also can be important. Um, and as for our buddy Robert Alter, um, as for the narrative, pay attention to any words describing Tamar or her relationship to the other characters. Pay attention to that. And what happens in the dialogue. Those are your two keys for this passage. So <clears throat> let's start with the chapter. Some time passed. David's son Absalom had a beautiful sister whose name was Tamar, and David's son Amnon fell in love with her. Trouble is brewing. This does not sound good. Um, Amnon was so tormented that he made himself ill because of his sister Tamar, for she was a virgin, and it seemed impossible to Amnon to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of David's brother Shemaiah, and Jonadab was a very crafty man. He said to him, Oh, son of the king, why are you so haggard morning after morning? Will you not tell me? Amnon said to him, I love Tamar, my, sister, my brother Absalom's sister. Right there, it's saying that Absalom is the obstacle for him to get to Tamar. Um, Jonadab said to him, lie down on your bed and pretend to be ill. And when your father comes to see you, say to him, let my sister Tamar come and give me something to eat and to prepare food in my sight so that I may see it and eat from her hand. So Amnon lay down and pretended to be ill. And when the king came to see him, Amnon said to the king, Please let my sister Tamar come and make a couple of cakes in my sight so that I may eat from her hand. So <clears throat> thus far, all of these characters are related. Oh, this is family drama. This is burgeoning incest. This is not good stuff. Uh, you got... David, and then you have Amnon, his oldest, and then you have Absalom, who's, uh, I think, second in line, yeah, and then Tamar. And so she actually, in that first uh, sentence, she's surrounded by her brothers. 
You got Amnon first, Tamar, and then Absalom. So she is surrounded by them. We know that tragedy is coming. Um, Amnon is the firstborn. He's the apparent um, heir to the throne, and he is infatuated with Tamar. But she has protected status as one of the king's daughters. Um, and Absalom is an obstacle to him. Um, he knows that Absalom is going to take care of her because they have both the same father and mother. Amnon has a different mother. Uh, yeah, polygamy, all that crazy stuff. <clears throat> so Tamar is described in relation to all of these men every time she is mentioned in this text. Every time. Um, and so what does this accomplish in the story? This tells us that what Amnon wants to do is really bad. It's his sister, his half-sister. Um, it also tells us how little Amnon and Jonadab regard women. She's just something to be trapped and used and abused. Also, their willingness to rope David into this scheme. They're going to rope the king into this. Um, so all three men thus far um, are mentioned in relation to David, but Tamar isn't mentioned in relation to David. Who's she mentioned in relation to? Absalom, not David. That is interesting, very interesting. Um, and so she's to come, he wants her to come and make these little cakes. Um, in the text, uh, it's, it's a word for like heart-shaped cakes. I imagine them like ancient pancakes where that are kind of grilled or put on a skillet over a fire or something like that. Um, and so <clears throat> they're little heart-shaped cakes. He says he loves her and he wants to have heart-shaped cakes. A little bit of a pun in Hebrew there. Let's move on on verse 7. Then David sent home to Tamar saying, go to your brother Amnon's house and prepare food for him. So Tamar went to her brother Amnon's house where he was lying down. She took dough, kneaded it, made cakes in his sight, and baked the cakes. Then she took the pan and set them out before him, but he refused to eat. Amnon said, send everyone out from me. So everybody went out from him. Then Amnon said to Tamar, bring the food into the chamber so that I may eat from your hand. So Tamar took the cakes that she had made and brought them into the chamber of her brother. So David sends his own daughter into this trap. That's just wrong. Um, it, it's really interesting when it talks about Tamar coming and she's making the cakes. Um, the text telescopes in on her. It's just her. She took the dough. She kneaded it. She made the cake. She baked the cake. She took the pan. She set them out. It's as if the text is giving you Amnon's perspective. He is watching her make these cakes. And so it's kind of creepy how it does that. So it is focused on her, and you know something is gone is going to happen. So this, this ruse for this desired bread um, is for this desired bread, but we know that Amnon desires Tamar. Um, and so these cakes were probably cooked over a fire in a brazier in the room, so that's why it's not in the kitchen, but in the, the living room where they are. Um, and so Amnon isolates Tamar from everybody in the house, and she trusts him. He is her brother. She trusts him. Um, Tribble says, the prince has duped the king, and the princess must pay the consequences. Moving on in verse 11. But when she brought them near to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, come, lie with me, my sister. She answered him, no, my brother, do not force me, for such a thing is not done in Israel. Do not do anything so vile. As for me, where can I carry my shame? And as for you, you would be as one of the scoundrels in Israel. Now, therefore, I beg you, speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you. But he would not listen to her. And being stronger than she, he forced her and he lay with her. 
she's able to speak. This is one of those moments where we're see, able to see her resist. She's trying to make him stop. Moving on into verse, well, the next verse. Then Amnon was seized with a very great loathing. How fast things changed. Love to hatred. His, uh, his loathing was even greater than the lust he had felt for her. Amnon said to her, get out. But she said to him, no, my brother, for this is wrong in sending me away. The, the, for this wrong in sending me away is greater than the other that you did to me. But he would not listen to her. He called the young man who served him and said, put this woman out of my presence and bolt the door after her. Now she was wearing a long robe with sleeves, for this is how the virgin daughters of the king were clothed in earlier times. So his servant put her out uh, and bolted the door after her. But Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the long robe that she was wearing, and she put her hand on her head and went away, crying aloud as she went. So... <clears throat> So Tamar is able to protest twice. This is really interesting that we have the words of this woman protesting twice in this situation. This has got to be a woman's, woman's story if there's that much of her words um, within this text. Um, it's really, really interesting. Also, during verses 11 through 18, her name is not given. It's just she. It's just the pronoun. Um, and so this, this kind of hints at her powerlessness. She has no name. Um, it also hints that she's become merely an object to Amnon, something to be abused, something to be used, something, something to be had. Um, she is not Tamar. She is not his sister. She is something that he wants. <clears throat> Um, and so she is dehumanized, essentially. Um, let's see here. Um, she gives two pro protests. First, she says, this is wrong. Think of the shame on us. Um, ask the king, and maybe he'll give, give me to you. Um, she do, she's not saying this because she likes him. Um, in the Old Testament law, a rapist had to marry his victim. Terrible law. It did keep the woman from becoming destitute and a burden on her family, um, but still, terrible law. <laughs> no, that, no woman would want that. Um, so she's essentially kind of appealing to that. Maybe then let's just marry me. Um, and so she's, yeah, she's trying to, she, she's trying not to become destitute. Women were, their experience, well, their, their lives were very precarious. If they didn't have the protection of their father, their husband, or a son, there was very little they could do. You, they could probably maybe work really hard to, in some sort of trade to take care of themselves, or often they fell into prostitution. It was, it was rough, very rough. Um, after she tells him that throwing her out is worse than raping her, and so he has increased the violence that he does to her when he, he casts her out, um, she's, being, she's feared being uh, abandoned by everyone. And so Amnon has changed towards her. He now hates Tamar, who he has loved. She's disposable to him. Um, and he throws her out into the street. And so she tears her clothes because she can no longer wear those robes. She can no longer wear the robes of the virgin daughters of the king. And so she tears them. Um, that also symbolizes her grieving. Um, they would grieve and rip, rend their clothes and put ashes on their head uh, and grieve very loudly, very loudly. And so she does exactly that. Um, she, um, she has experienced this great loss, and she's letting everybody know um, exactly what has happened. Um, verse 20, <clears throat> her brother Absalom said to her, has Amnon, your brother, been with you? He knows immediately what has happened. Be quiet for now, my sister. He is your brother. Do not take this to heart. Not a great answer. <laughs> 
So Tamar remained a desolate woman in her brother Absalom's house. When King David heard all of these things, he became very angry, but he would not punish his son Amnon because he loved him, for he was his firstborn. And Absalom spoke to Amnon neither good nor bad, for Absalom hated Amnon because he raped his sister Tamar. Absalom knows immediately what happened to her. Um, his speech isn't very comforting, but his actions are. He takes her into his house. He takes on the burden of caring for her. Um, he's going to provide for her the rest of his life. Um, and then David, her father, what does he do? He gets angry. Does it say why? No, he's, he's angry. Um, and... <clears throat> We don't, yeah, he's angry. Uh, oh, no, it does say. No, he's angry and he doesn't punish Amnon because he loves him. Sorry about that. Um, so his daughter is raped by his son, but he doesn't do anything. But Absalom doesn't forget. Absalom later on, uh, two years later, he uh, does his own trickery and assassinates Amnon. Gets rid of him. And so that is, that's the long game, man. Two years later. Um, it's murder. Also justice, but murder. There are better ways to handle that. But, uh, but Absalom loves his sister. You got to admit that. He loves her and he takes care of her. Um, today, um, the basic plot of the story is one that could ha happen on any university campus. I teach at a university. I teach 18 to 25 year olds, 70 to 25 year olds. Sometimes they're younger. Um, and <clears throat> it happens on campuses. Um, so a young man becomes infatuated with a pretty young woman. Infatuation becomes obsession and lust. He's so distracted um, by his infatuation that a friend tells him just to do something about it and offers him a plan. Um, all the young man needs is the opportunity uh, there's more to this story, to, um, to the rape of Tamar, but essentially it is a man overpowering, overpowering a woman physically and emotionally to take what he wants. Amnon and Tamar are both young adults um, of marriageable age, much like college, like college students today. Um, campus sexual assault of young women is an alarming problem. College-aged women, 18 to 24, are three times more at risk of sexual violence than all other women. That is terrifying, terrifying. Um, College-aged women are more likely to be sexually assaulted than robbed, terrifying. I can't help but think of a sexual assault case from 2015 when reading this story. Um, known in her rapist trial as Emily Doe, she came out later known and t shared her name with the world, Chanel Miller. Um, she was sexually assaulted in January of 2015 behind a fr frat house um, at Stanford University. While intoxicated at a party, her attacker took advantage of her, of her blacked out state and assaulted her behind a dumpster. In her riveting victim statement, she asserts, he admitted wanting to hook up with someone. I was the wounded antelope of the herd, completely alone and vulnerable, physically unable to fend for myself, and he chose me. Sometimes I think, if I hadn't gone, then this never would have happened. But then I realized it would have happened just to somebody else, just to somebody else. Her rapist was found guilty of three felonies, but sentenced to only six months in jail. Six months in jail. He was given a light sentence because this was his first offense, and the recommend, recommendation to the court said he had surrendered a hard-earned swimming scholarship. <laughs> the judge said of the sentence, a prison sentence would have a severe impact on him. I think he will not be a danger to others. <laughs> I think he's still a danger. Um, he was released after three months. The sympathy of the court was with the rapist, not the victim. And this sounds familiar. 
Um, let's turn back to Tamar. Uh, Tamar's experience in the text, first, she's powerless, but she's not silent. I love this about Tamar. Um, the story of the rape of Tamar in 2 Samuel 13 is admittedly complicated. It has incest, fratricide, an unresponsive king and father. Amnon and Tamar are half-siblings, both having the King David as their father, but different mothers. Um, I've already said that, sorry. Um, but Tamar is powerless from the beginning. Um, she goes where she's told. She has no reason not to as well. She's trusting, but she has, she has to go where her dad tells her to go. Um, and so Amnon, yeah. Amnon then takes advantage of their isolation and begins to take advantage of her. However, Tamar breaks her silence and tells him it is a vile thing, how it will bring shame on both of them. So she's, she's bringing it into him too. It's not just her. This woman's smart and she is wise. She's not, it's not just, what are you doing to me, but your reputation too, brother. She's very smart. Um, and perhaps she, uh, perhaps trying to stall him, she also proposes that if he were to ask their father or the king, it's interesting here, if you ask the king, he would give him to her properly. Not dad, not father, the king. That's kind of indicative of how their relationship is. She's not been referenced um, in relation to David at all. It's just been her brothers. Amnon ignores her and overpowers her and abuses her and rapes her. His love curdles into hatred as he commands her to get up and leave. She protests again, being cast out is worse than the rape itself. And then he demands, and this is interesting in the Hebrew, uh, this creature be expelled from his house. The Hebrew word there, a translation of it, can be not woman, but this creature, this thing. Get this thing out of my house. She's not even human to him anymore. Get it out. Um, and so she, um, he, has, he dehumanizes her yet further. But Tamar will not be silent. In the street, she begins loudly and dramatically grieving all that she has lost, tearing her expensive clothing, throwing dust on and covering her head. When Absalom encounters her in this state, I imagine that she's like on the way to his house. He meets her at the gate, and he knows. Um, Sorry. Uh, Absalom encounters her in this state, and he asks Sam if it was Amnon. He knows what has happened. He tells her to remain quiet for now, um, ominously, be quiet for now, um, and not to take it to heart. In the text, Tamar remains powerless and now silent, living in Absalom's house as a desolate woman. David hears about the event and is angry, but the Hebrew doesn't state what he's angry about. Um, the father of both the rapist and the victim does nothing. Nothing. Absalom plays it cool, plotting his revenge um, for two years later, um, and then also leads a rebellion against his father, David. I mean, how much of that is motivated by this fact, by what has happened to his sister? <clears throat> Uh, I, moving on, Tamar is a trauma victim, yet she's a recovering survivor. Juliana Klassens is a German um, Old Testament scholar, and she presents an interesting reading of Tamar's experience. She sees Tamar as suffering from rape trauma syndrome, um, a, a post-traumatic stress condition. She moves from diagnosis to conceive a recovery for Tamar using the text and imagination. She notes three stages of, of the recovery are, and I'll move through them. Number one, establishing safety. Tamar's recovery begins as she finds safety in Absalom's home under the protection of her brother. Absalom functions as Tamar's advocate. While much of what, what he does is treacherous and treasonous, he does get revenge, um, Absalom acts where their father has failed. Um, he speaks to Tamar on his own authority, not on the behalf of his father, but his own authority. He actively protects and supports her. And he names his own daughter Tamar. 2 Samuel 14. He names his daughter Tamar. That, that tells you how he feels about her. Excuse me. 
Classens also imagines relationships with the women of Absalom's household being really important to her um, and having a positive effect, effect um, with the family relationships, um, being able to help bring about her healing. She may never marry. She may never have a life outside of that household, but she has those ladies, and they would work together a lot. So establishing safety. Tamar thankfully has safety. And then there is remembering and mourning the traumatic event. Tamar instinctually begins the second stage mourning. Um, by mourning, the trauma survivor is able to reclaim her voice to become a subject once more, resisting the dehumanization experienced on account of the traumatic event. So she resists her dehumanization by saying no four times. If you count them, she says no four times. Um, when she presents various arguments to stop him, she continues her resistance. When Tamar is expelled from the household, does she just meekly go home? She is crying and yelling and causing a scene all the way home. She wants everybody to know what has happened to her. And it's Amnon's fault. He has done this to me. Um, and so she's, conspicu she's conspicuously beginning her mourning and indicating the violence that she has just experienced. Her exit is a public indictment against the injustice of Amnon's behavior. Both Tamar and, sorry, both Tamar, Tamar and Chanel Miller found and used their words potentially benefiting their recovery. Read a Tamar, or Chanel Miller has written articles about her experience, and you can Google her, her survivor statement. It is riveting, riveting, and I'm so thankful for her words. Number three, <clears throat> reconnecting with ordinary life. The final stage is reconnecting, reconnecting with the wider community or the, the task of creating a future. The old beliefs that gave meaning to Tamar's life have been challenged, and now she must find a new sustaining belief. There's no way to know if Tamar was actually able to, to reconnect. We only know that she lived out the rest of her life in her brother's house. But we can imagine a woman who's an important member of that household beloved by her nephews and nieces, particularly the one named for her. I think imagining the stage for Tamar is essential when considering this story as Tamar, of Tamar as a survivor, not a victim. Essential. Last, David is concerned with his sons but not his daughter. I will never forgive David for this. Never. I can't help but draw a parallel between David's response to, to the rape of his daughter and the court sentencing of Chanel Miller's rapist. In both stories, everyone knows and understands the man is guilty of sexual assault. One escapes punishment, the one gets arguably very little, very little punishment. While the Hebrew doesn't give the reason for David's anger, the Greek Septuagint does. It adds, but he did not punish the spirit of Amnon, his son, because he loved him and he was his firstborn. He didn't punish him because oh, I love that kid. I'm not going to punish him. Sometimes you got to call the cops, man. Sometimes. So, and eventually, David will publicly mourn each son after their deaths. After Amnon is assassinated by Absalom, big mourning. After Absalom leads a civil war against his father and is killed in battle and is his father's enemy, he mourns his son. But he does nothing for Tamar. David loves his sons, but not his daughters. There is no mention of his thoughts about Tamar's abuse. Tribble says, how appropriate that the story never refers to David and Tamar as father and daughter. 
The father identifies with the son. The adulterer supports the rapist. Male has joined male to deny justice for the female. The church has a history of prioritizing the reputations of men over the physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being of women who have been victims of assault and harassment and abuse. Um, the Houston Chronicles expose presenting research discovering that over 400 male church leaders who abused over 700 victims over 20 years in the Southern Baptist Convention. This came out, what's the date on that? In February of 2019. I had a slow simmering rage all that spring after I read this. This is just one denomination. This is the Southern Baptist Convention. The church should be a safe place for everyone. But instead, abusers are often shuttled around church to church with very little consequence to the destruction that they leave behind. People, we got to believe women. We have to call out abuse. We have to hold the guilty accountable. We have to. There are, there are, there are dozens and hundreds and thousands of women who are victims to this who are broken because of this. We have to believe women. We have to. The biblical text contains sexual abuse of women. We have these stories of the text of terror, and they have a place for us in our churches. We need to read them. We need to engage with them. We need to carefully do that. We, not cavalierly, but we need to carefully do that with the knowledge that at least a quarter of the people, men and women, in our congregations have been abused. Carefully do that. And if we do this from the stage, if we do this in our Bible studies carefully, it can bring healing. You're giving affirmation that these things have happened. Yes, I believe you that these things have happened. And that is the beginning of healing. That is the beginning of healing. Um, when, when using these texts, we have to remember that we need to recognize the violence. Um, let your reading be a sacred witness for these ancient women today. We have to read it for her, with her as the main character. Um, and we have to recognize any resistance, female resistance, if it's in the text. Do they have a voice? Is there any agency? And if there isn't, like in the horrible story of the Levite's concubine at the end of Judges... What can we maybe imagine some side of, sort of resistance? Something to be able to work with that. That story, uh, there's no way I could work with that today. But uh, with tomorrow, I can. Um, some more questions for you to think about. What is it like for a woman to read this story? It's terrifying. She's trapped. She's tricked. Her father sent her there. Her brother is the one who attacks her. It's horrific. And as a woman, I can't walk on the street by myself at night. I feel her danger. I feel her anxiety. I can imagine myself her tricked into going a place, to a place that I think is safe. But it's not. I can imagine that. What is it like for a woman to hear a sermon given by a man on this story? That's our, our typical situation. It depends on how it's handled. If it's handled with care, it can be, yes, he sees. He knows these things happen. If it's not handled with care, and if it focuses on the men, you are just shoving her in the corner. You are, it, you are telling her that she doesn't matter. Her experiences don't matter. Her abuse doesn't matter. What matters is those stupid sons. What is it like for a woman to hear a sermon given by a woman on this story? Ladies, ask yourself that question. What is it like? For myself, 
I've never heard a woman give a sermon on the story. This is the first time <laughs> I'm hearing it. <laughs> um, it really feels nice. I feel seen. I should, because I wrote it. But if it feels nice. I feel included in what is going on. What is it like for a man to hear a sermon given by a woman on this story? Gentlemen, what does it feel like? I hope you hear a brand new world. You're like, I never would have imagined that women feel this, that women see this. I remember many years ago, um, my pastor, uh, we were in a discussion, and he talked about how his wife had told him um, that she had been sexually harassed, that somebody had catcalled her, or just somebody had said terrible things to her. And he's like, I couldn't believe that happened to her. And then, and, and then has that happened to any of you ladies? And we're all like, yep, it has. Well, probably every woman in here has been at least sexually harassed. That is horrible. That should not be how it is. I should be able to walk down the street at night and not be scared for my life. I should be able to do that. But I can't. So we need you guys to help us make it a better world. To help us to make it a safer place. I'm going to give you a couple more reflection questions. I'm going to try and give you these next three at the end of um, all the talks I give from here on out. What new things do we see or understand when we listen to women while reading this story? Anybody want to share? What new things do we see or understand when we listen to women while reading this story? In my church, we talk back at each other. <laughs> Sadly, not that much has changed. Sadly, not that much has changed. Yeah. Anybody else? Was the one over here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so he's a serial predator. This is what he does. She said that if he did it to Tamar, he's probably done it before. He is, a not, he is not a safe man. That's a good one. Anything else? She's smart and talented, or the king would have been like, oh, no, she's not a good cook. <laughs> yeah, he, sends, he knows she can handle the job, so he sends her out. She's smart and talented. Mm-hmm. It is really hard to make heart-shaped cakes. <laughs> I've tried. I really have. Put a marble in a cupcake tit. That did not work. <laughs> Look bad. Yes, he is. Jonadab is a predator, too. He's an enabler. He is. Yep. This happens in every culture, and it's probably way more prevalent than any of us ever would imagine or anything like that. So it's just a new thing to be aware of as we begin interaction, as we try to show Christ's love to people, that they may be experiencing these pains and griefs that um, we need to be sensitive to. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Even when some things are out of your control, you can still try to find the best outcome for it. She tries her best. She really does try her best, yeah. I think Those that power. women should teach their sons to respect women. Uh-huh. Women should teach their sons right to respect to women. Protect them. Yeah. Or something. Those in power really work hard to maintain status quo. 
Yes, they do. Those in power work hard to maintain the status quo. It seems to me this story is telling us why a person named Solomon was next king instead of the oldest children of David. And I think we need to bring that consequence into this story mm -hmm. or we don't understand what God is doing. Yeah, Solomon does. Uh, he is the next king. Uh, the other guy, there's another king who tries to crown himself or another son that tries to crown himself, but Solomon um, is made king. Although Solomon doesn't have a great track record with the ladies either. <laughs> a thousand wives, does he even know their names? <laughs> um, no matter how great of a king you are or a godly person you are, you still got to be a good father to your Yeah, father. that's your first job. Mm-hmm. Yes, he is. That's a, really, that's a really hard one to swallow for us who have been um, taught to see David as the great hero, but he's, uh, he's has got some problems. I'm struck by the presence of the community that um, preserved her multiple no's throughout the biblical record. Yeah. There's a group of people that came around and said, it's not just one, it's multiple times. Yeah. That yeah. Right. I think the Holy Spirit was really well involved in that making sure that we had those four no's, that she really had her words in there. I feel like she gave that final no where she could have walked out of there and hidden what, what happened to her. Yeah. And she didn't. No. She shouted it to everybody that she had been violated and she was no longer. It seems like that is like the final no. Yeah. Let's add a fifth. <laughs> That's awesome. Mm -hmm. But also, we need to be cautious. Like, we, we have to talk about it. We do. As a church, because it has gotten so swept under the rug for so yeah. long. Yeah. And um, women are very marginalized. Yeah. And one, of the, one of the excuses that gets passed around um, that why churches will often hide it is it's going to damage our witness if yeah. it's said that one of our pastors has abused someone in our, in our church. What kind of witness is it if you stand up and say, this guy hurt someone and he's out and we called the cops? That's a witness too. That is a witness focused on the image of God in the women in your church, in the, in the victims of your church, whether they're men or women, because men receive it too. And people outside the church. Yes. Yeah. And when it's swept under the rug, that that's not that's just as much of a negative witness to them as anything else. Is. Yep. It is. It is. Man, you guys are good. I love it. I'll just I'll just kind of go to the next couple. How does this affect how I see my my female neighbor? My female neighbor. Um, I'll let you answer that for yourselves. We've done a lot of that already. What do I learn about the character of God from reading this way? We don't hear a lot of God in this text. It's the people doing the stuff. But what do I learn about the character of God? I, for me, I learn that God has given me judgment, that I can read this and say, this is wrong. These people are behaving terribly. Tamar needs support. That, that God has given me that ability and that he cares for his people and he wants to train us to be on the side of the victims, to take care of them. That's just me, off the cuff. Oh my gosh. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, 
Let's pray. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for these stories of broken women in the Bible. I thank you for their witness. I thank you for um, just their example. And I thank you for the broken women and the broken men in this room. I pray that engaging with these words has, has brought some healing. I pray that continued healing will happen and that you will just move into their hearts in a special way and help them to feel seen and help them to feel heard. Help us to have eyes and empathy for women in the text and in our lives, to recognize when people are broken, when people are in pain. And thank you again for the story of Tamar. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Dagley. And thank you, brothers and sisters. Wow. Wow. Listening to voices from the margin. Tonight, um, uh, we will have an adult fireside and we will have youth fire, what did I call it, fireside, bonfire, and youth fireside.